Hello everyone, this is David Larson. I'm the Associate Chair for Performance Improvement in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University, and this is the Radiology Improvement Team Education Program. Today's topic is psychological aspects of change. Up to now, we've mostly discussed the mechanics of change. Well, there's a glaring hole that we have not yet addressed. You may have heard the phrase, management would be easy if it weren't for all the people. The reality is that people are intelligent, emotional, sometimes irrational human beings, and thank goodness that's the case. But if we want to be able to change an organization, we need to have a reasonable understanding of how people think about change. Furthermore, as it turns out, people are very social beings. What we do is largely influenced by what others do. Again, this is a great thing, but if we want to understand how to lead change in an organization, we need to not only understand the psychological aspects of change, but we also need to understand the sociological aspects of change, or how change moves through social networks. Have you ever led a change effort? When you start out, there's so much hope and optimism. It seems that you are destined for success. Then you embark on that journey and the storms set in. All too often, our change efforts do not survive the storms. Failing in a change effort is highly demoralizing to individuals and organizations, and it happens all the time. Contrary to what we would like to think, failure definitely is an option. Previously, we've talked about learning from our failures, but we've also emphasized that we want to fail fast, fail small, and fail friendly. That's different from catastrophic failure. The reason why we want to quickly get out our small failures is to prevent large failures from happening. We do not want catastrophic failures at all. Navigating the, the waters of change can be treacherous. We need to anticipate what can go wrong and what will give us the greatest likelihood of success, especially when it comes to dealing with people. Dr. Paul Batalden has said, all improvement requires change, but not all change is an improvement. In other words, if you want to improve the organization, you need to change, change the organization. But as you change the organization, it's not guaranteed that you'll make it better. You may, in fact, change it for the worse. Organizational change involves moving from one way of doing things to another way of doing things. In order to create reliability and consistency in an organization, we install mechanisms to ensure stability, like training, policies, and procedures, measurement and feedback, and so forth. Those already exist in our current situation and will eventually exist in our new situation. However, in times of change, we intentionally create instability in the organization as we revisit our processes, policies, and structures. But this is stressful on individuals and on the organization as a whole, and can lead to a situation that is worse than where we started. In the process, it can create rivalries, humiliation, and resentment. So in this tutorial, we're going to briefly touch on five concepts to consider as you lead change in your area. Diffusion of innovation, social networks, influencers, incentives, and the progress principle. Everett Rogers was an accomplished professor of sociology and statistics who wrote extensively on the diffusion of innovations. Professor Rogers noticed that innovations don't always spread evenly and aren't only based on the advantages and disadvantages that the innovation will bring to the user. Rogers believed that different people tend to adopt innovation in different ways. He talks about five types of adopters, the innovator, the early adopter, the early majority, the late majority, and the traditionalist. An innovation that will eventually be widely adopted moves through these groups step by step. He describes the innovator as an individual who is constantly on the lookout for the latest and greatest. He or she is eager to adopt an innovation and is willing to take the risk that the innovation won't pan out or that the innovation might make them look silly or stand out in a crowd. The innovator also tends to become bored and quickly move on to new innovations. The early adopter tends to be more judicious than the innovator, but is willing to give most anything a try as long as it's reasonable. The early majority adopter is willing to adopt an innovation only after the advantages become clear. He or she will not take significant risks, but once it looks like the innovation or the change is going to catch on, we'll go ahead and jump on board. The late majority adopter will only adopt the change after the average person has already adopted it. And the traditionalist tends to not only be skeptical, but also tends to be change averse. He or she is less susceptible to logical arguments and social pressure, and will generally only jump on board after there's little other choice. There are a few takeaways to remember from Roger's model. First, innovations take time to be adopted. Be patient and recognize the types of people in your group. Second, innovators are helpful to develop and test early process changes even when the ideas are still primitive. Third, early adopters are helpful to continue to test and refine process changes. Fourth, when you're ready to roll out the change, it's important to quickly win over the early majority. Fifth, as the change continues to roll out, win over the late majority by addressing concerns individually. And sixth, do not spend too much effort on winning over the traditionalists, at least not at first. 
That brings us to our next model. In 2013, Batalana and Caschiaro published an insightful piece in the Harvard Business Review entitled the, Net the Network Secrets of Great Change Agents. They describe an organization as a series of social networks. Most organizations have a formal hierarchy, as you know, with a traditional top-down reporting structure. It's tempting for managers to believe that change can be simply handed down the chain of command and that that will result in compliance on the front line. This is actually a misrepresentation of how relationships really exist in an organization and how factors of influence exist. In reality, an organization also contains a series of social networks with informal hierarchy. In this hierarchy, there are some people who many people confide in, who serve as a conduit for information and who may have more influence than their position might suggest. In order to be able to promote change in an organization, it helps to have a reasonable understanding of this informal structure in your organization. The irony is, of course, that the higher up you are in the organization, the less you are likely to know about the informal networks because few people are going to come right out and tell you. Additionally, Batalana and Cascaro talk about three types of change agents, endorsers, fence sitters, and resistors. Endorsers will embrace the change on its merits if they think it's a good idea. Once they've embraced it, they're less susceptible to social pressure. Fence sitters are, well, on the fence when it comes to change. They're waiting to see how others will react. They tend to be more susceptible to social pressure since they could go either way with the change in terms of the merits alone. Resistors are resistant to the change and tend to be resistant to most changes. They're less susceptible to social pressure and can influence others to resist the change as well. A few useful takeaways and strategies from this model. Remember that change does not simply move from the top down. If you still think that, then quite frankly, you're a bit naive. Recognize and respect the existence of social networks that often have little to do with official rank or position. Some individuals are more influential in any organization than others. If the most influential agents are endorsers, they can be extremely helpful to your cause. If the most influential agents are on the fence, then the direction they go likely will have a big impact on your project. Alternatively, if the most influential agents are resistors, then you need to think strategically. You're unlikely to win them over, at least at first, and it's even possible that they will negatively influence you and others instead. So don't spend too much time or effort trying to win them over, but also don't tolerate direct, belligerent public challenges. Our next model is The Influencer, published by Patterson and team. They describe two major domains that affect how people change, motivation and ability. In other words, people change if they want to and are able to. They further subdivide, subdivide these into three more specific domains, personal, social, and structural. For example, say you have a group of individuals that are doing things a certain way, and to reach your collective goal, they need to do things a different way. In other words, you want to move them from here to there. You need to understand that there are certain barriers that you will need to help them overcome. These include personal motivation, personal ability, social pressure, and structural ability. With personal motivation, individuals are asking themselves, why do I have to do this? It feels threatening, so individuals are internally deciding whether to resist the change or to go along with it. Strategies to overcome this barrier include illustrating the current group performance, illustrating where it should be, and making the case for why it's important to get to where you should be and how these changes that you're promoting are likely to help make that happen. Engage in a dialogue and be willing to entertain reasonable questions and challenges. With personal ability, individuals are asking themselves, what exactly are you looking for? And how exactly do I do it? They're telling themselves, I'm not sure I can do this. Habits are, after all, hard to break. To overcome this barrier, provide coaching, answer questions, be supportive, and be patient. I recommend providing general feedback at first while people are getting used to the change, and then gradually moving to more specific individual feedback. Social pressure is a commonly underestimated barrier. Individuals are looking around and asking what the rest of the group is doing. They don't want to be seen as a brown noser. Their social status may be threatened. To overcome this barrier, enlist your opinion leaders. Don't push too hard at first, but seek true engagement. Instead of telling them exactly how to do it, discuss your common vision and let them figure out the best way to reach that vision. Finally, structural ability refers to how easy it is to do the right thing. This is the manager's responsibility. If the equipment is outdated, the systems keep crashing, or time is not allotted to work on improvement, then not only is the change less likely to happen, but you're likely to also lose people's engagement. 
As a leader, you need to make the investment in equipment and IT systems. You need to protect people's time. You need to recognize that whether you know it or not, there is an implicit contract between frontline workers and managers. That is, the workers do their best to do the right thing, and the managers do their best to make it as easy as possible for the workers to do the right thing. If you as a manager are not living up to your end of the bargain, then you should not be disappointed or surprised when the frontline workers do not live up to their end. That leads us to the concept of incentives. This is a very important topic to which we are doing a complete injustice by moving through it so quickly, but here are the major takeaway points. Alfie Cohn has published a great deal of research on this topic. He's a strong believer that rewards, just like punishments, undermine change efforts. He gives five major reasons why rewards fail. First, rewards punish. Punishment and rewards are simply two sides of the same coin. The intent of both is to manipulate. Second, rewards rupture relationships because of their manipulative nature. Third, rewards ignore legitimate reasons for not changing and let managers off without addressing the barriers we discussed earlier. Fourth, rewards discourage risk-taking. Those who will lose out on a reward when they are legitimately trying to improve the process will stop trying to improve the process. And fifth, rewards reduce individuals' intrinsic motivation in a task. Daniel Pink is a more recent author who's also tackled the subject. If you haven't seen his TED Talk, I would highly recommend it. He identifies seven problems with carrots and sticks, which are very similar to those articulated by Alfie Cohn. He illustrates that they tend to extinguish intrinsic motivation, diminish performance, now that's ironic, they diminish performance, crush creativity, crowd out legitimately good behavior, encourage cheating, shortcuts, and unethical behavior. They tend to become addictive, and they tend to foster short-term rather than long-term thinking. Pink emphasizes that both rewards and punishment tend to result in compliance rather than engagement. That tends to work well for simple, straightforward tasks like rats in a maze, but they're counterproductive for work that requires creativity or cognitive skill. So here you have a group of people you want to move from here to there. If you bring out the bulldozer in the form of incentives, either positive or negative, you will likely reach your goal, but you will not have addressed the barriers. You will have angered a lot of people in the meantime, and when you take the incentives away, they're likely to go right back where they started. On the contrary, you can be much more effective if you're reasonable, patient, and approach it strategically. Some will buy in immediately. As you start to address barriers, others will come on board. And with time, patience, and persistence addressing more barriers, most of the rest will come on board. Then, finally, if you have to use an incentive, now is the time, after you've worked so hard to bring in uh, so many people and engage them. Those that have not come on board by now may, in fact, need a little nudge. So we're going to wrap up this tutorial uh, with a quick reference to the work of Teresa Amabil and Stephen Kramer. In their research, they found that the best way to motivate people day in and day out is by facilitating progress, even small wins. But the managers in our survey, in their survey, ranked supporting progress dead last as a work motivator. Amabil and Kramer found that, in general, people want meaningful work. What is considered meaningful depends on whether people perceive that they're contributing to something or someone that matters. It's amazing the lengths that people are willing to go in these circumstances. In summary, when we're leading change, we should think strategically, recognize the existence of and importance of social networks, consider motivation and ability, including personal, social, and structural aspects, be careful with incentives, and ensure that individuals are making visible progress toward meaningful accomplishment. Once again, despite the best intents, change efforts can go very badly. There's no guarantee of success. But there are definite strategies that will increase the likelihood of reaching safe harbor of an improved and once again stable system. Use those strategies for your patient's benefit. Ignore those strategies at your peril. Thank you for your attention. This is David Larson with the Radiology Improvement Team Education Program.